Today I want to talk about walking with God. And I want to read first from uh, Genesis 5 verses 22 through 24. It says there, And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Now we know very little about Enoch from, from the biblical account. However, a lot can be found in extra biblical sources. Not the least of which, of course, is the book of Enoch. But also the book of Jubilees, uh, which tells us that he was the first who learned writing and that he received great wisdom. And he wrote the visions of seasons and months and years, uh, the calendar, you can say. Um, but the Bible tells us actually all that we need to know, um, even in this small uh, section. Uh, first of all, his name, Enoch. It means teaching or instructing. And secondly, we learn that he walked with God, which is today's theme. And that's why I chose this text. And thirdly, we learn that he was taken up. He did not die. He was taken up. And, um, okay, from the book of Jubilees we learn then that he was placed in the Garden of Eden. But the point here is uh, the name. The name is the character. It's instructing or teaching. Secondly, he walked with God. And thirdly, he was taken up. And this, these three characteristics make him a type of the church, a type for the church. The church is, this should be teaching, instructing, and should obviously walk with God. And the church will be taken up, just like Enoch before disaster uh, strikes, destruction comes, uh, as Enoch was taken before the flood. So, Enoch walked with God. What does that mean? What does it mean? Okay, literally, we understand, of course, to walk means to put one foot in front of the other in order to, to move from one place to another place. But in the Bible, uh, it uh, has a different meaning, uh, usually. Uh, it's used over 400 times, and uh, it has uh, to do, um, in most cases, with the course of life, the way we behave. And... <clears throat> Some translations said, say instead of he walked with God, he pleased God. And uh, this is actually um, what, is, what is meant uh, when we read um, about Enoch in Hebrews, in chapter 11, verse 5, we find that same uh, phrase. It says that by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. So to walk with God is to please God. So if walking with God means please, to please him, and it refers to our course of life, us being the church, then we better understand what it means. How do we live our lives? Uh, is it in, in lockstep with God? so that we please him? This is a very important question, and uh, I would ask it differently. Um, what do we need in order to walk with God, in order to please God? Uh, which attributes, um, so that we can, can test ourselves and also can maybe work on certain areas. So I want to make it practically, practical. So, uh, I have five attributes that I want to highlight that um, are required in order to walk with God, in order to please God. And the first one is righteousness. Righteousness is a word that we find many, many times in the Bible, and um, we all have a certain perception with, uh, with it, but what, what is it? Well, let's first see what it is not, um, so we can uh, rule out... Um, what many may think. It's not self-righteousness. It's not self-righteousness. And the Bible is very clear what's, what self-righteousness is, is worth. 
uh, in Isaiah 64 verse 6, it says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as, a filthy, as filthy rags. So that's our righteousness. Our self-righteousness is like a filthy rag, an unclean thing. So that's out the window, I would say. Um, by the way, the text used here in Isaiah is very graphic. Um, this filthy rag, the, the, the word being used there in the original, refers to um, actually a menstruation cloth that was used in those days. So, um, yeah, it's very graphic, but it's also very clear. So, what is it then? How do we find out? Let's uh, look at, what, uh, at some examples. First of all, um, Abram. Um, what is said about Abram in Genesis 15 verse 6? There it says, And he, that's Abram, believed in the Lord, and he, God, counted it for him, to him for righteousness. And this is repeated in the New Testament in Romans 4 verse 3. There Paul writes, For what saith the scripture, Abram believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Hmm. So righteousness is imputed upon us. It's ascribed to us. Um, and that happens upon justification. How do we get justified? Well, there's only one way through Christ. Now, you will say, yeah, but Abram was uh, through faith. Yes, uh, it happens through faith, <laughs> by grace, through faith. And um, this uh, applies even in retrospect um, to the, the, the time before Jesus was revealed to us as, uh, as a person. Uh, and we see that uh, certain men in the Old Testament um, understood it um, even without knowing Jesus as a person. Um, so what is that righteousness? What is it? How can we replace the word with something else? <clears throat> Psalm 119 it tells us what it is in verse 172. For all thy commandments are righteousness. In other words, God's word is righteousness. And therefore we must conform to it and live by it. And Matthew 4, uh, Jesus um, tells us this, and he quotes actually from Deuteronomy. He says there, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. He refers to the word. The word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. We should live by it. It's like bread. We, we, we consume it. It's, um, it's what we live on. So that we will be nurtured spiritually and we will also grow. Grow in righteousness. So righteousness is a very important factor. That's the first attribute. The second one, and we actually mentioned it already because of what we read about Abram. The second one is faith. Um, it takes great faith to walk with God. Actually, without faith, it's impossible. It's impossible. That's what it says in Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Remember, to please him was a replacement of walking with God, pleasing God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, without faith, we get nowhere. We cannot walk with God without faith. So, this whole chapter, Hebrews 11, is about faith. And uh, it lists those who walked by it and how they were justified by it. So, uh, we find there, of course, again, also Abram. But we read it before from Genesis and from Romans. So, we are saved by grace through faith. Faith prevents us from relying on our own understanding. Faith prevents us from having fears and anxiety. And with that allowing the devil from using those fears and anxieties against us. So if we combine these two we see that we show our love for God by obeying him. 
his word and by believing what he says. And actually this is the first and great commandment as Jesus summarizes the Ten Commandments into two. Uh, he says as the first and great, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. So that is basically um, what happens when we, um, we uh, have faith and um, believe and follow his word. That honors God and it pleases God. And so in this, this diagram I show um, the five attributes of which we have now uh, covered two. And you see that these two, righteousness and, righteousness and faith, um, basically answer to this first and great commandment. The second great commandment is, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And so the second uh, or the, the third and the fourth attribute have to do with that. And so the third one is integrity. Enoch was a man of great integrity, which means honesty. It means he was a man that people could trust. He would do what is right. Why? Because he was following the way of God. This is how people should see us. They should know, when they get to know us, even a little bit, they should know that they can trust us because we do what is right, because we follow the way of God. Integrity must be part of the fruit that we produce. It must be part of our testimony. It must be the evidence of our faith. And there are great examples in the Bible. For example, Job. Job loses everything, everything. But in spite of that, he is not willing to lose his integrity. In Job 27, verse 5, we read, God forbid that I should justify you. Until I die, I will not remove my integrity from me. So no matter what happens, I will not lose my integrity, my honesty. I will stick with it. And by the way, he says the same of his righteousness um, in the next verse, verse 6 of Job 27. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. So we see that this man, Job, uh, uh, there was no one more perfect eh, in the earth. It says in Job 1, he uh, pleased God. He walked with God because... Um, he, uh, he held this very high. He believed God, his faith was strong. He held onto his righteousness and integrity. King David too saw the important, importance of both righteousness and integrity. In Psalm 7 verse 8, he writes, The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity that is in me. So these men saw the importance of both these attributes and it was part of their being, of their testimony. And uh, also um, David's son Solomon, he wrote uh, how, in, how um, important integrity was and how this must be part of our walk with the Lord, our course of life. In Proverbs 20, verse 7, he writes, The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. The just man walketh in his integrity. So he links it here to walking, to the course of life. Also in Proverbs 11, verse 3, he writes, The integrity of the upright shall guide them. Integrity is immensely important. And we see uh, that in this world, uh, it's hard to find people that have integrity in their heart to find. There are so many dishonest people, so many people that have this false falsehood over them. <clears throat> and it's, uh, it's sad and disappointing. Another characteristic, another attribute that is uh, necessary uh, in order to please God is humility. True humility. And again, I have to say, true humility is hard to find among Christians, among people in general, but among Christians also. 
there is a lot of false humility. And as soon as you speak scriptural truth that may offend brother or sister, then you uh, meet hard and high egos. And uh, you meet everything but humility. And uh, yeah, I have to say also uh, online, uh, if you read some of the comments, uh, even here in YouTube, um, and I don't want to generalize, there are many uh, dear brothers and sisters who, uh, who write uh, um, humble and, and uh, sincere uh, um, comments, but there is a lot, a lot that um, is... Um, where you you will be hard pressed to find any humility. Instead, you see a lot of inflated egos and uh, a lot of fitting in and a lot of conforming to. It's really a world of self-love. But when we walk with God, for real, then we will see His greatness in comparison to ourselves, and our ego will shrink to what it should be. And then we understand what Paul writes in Galatians 6, verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. It's very clear. And the prophet Micah links this humility to our walking with the Lord. In Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He hath shewed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee? but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. You walk, but you walk humbly. It's like a little child holding the hand of, of the father, of his father. He is a little child. He knows when he feels this big hand um, holding him. There is nothing, uh, there's no place there. Um, for, for arrogance or pride or jealousy. This does not befit us when we walk with the creator of the universe. Now being humbly doesn't mean that one can also not be passionate and bold in doing the will of God. We should not confuse this. Uh, and we see it also in Jesus. He could be very offensive. He could be politically incorrect. And he could even be aggressive. We see that when he clean, cleanses the temple. temple. So this, that does not mean that he was not also humble. And uh, he, he characterizes himself uh, like that in Matthew 11 verse 29. Where he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls. He was humble. But he was also bold and passionate and true. And he is. So that's humility. And then the fifth and last uh, attribute that I want to mention is commitment. In all that we do, we have to have commitment. When we walk with the Lord, we have to be committed. We cannot be running off to do other things whenever we want and we feel like it. Uh, we must be all in, or if not, then we are all out. Psalm 37 verse 5 reads, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Commit thy way. It's not a loose, um, a loose uh, relationship that uh, whenever it suits you, uh, Okay, uh, but if not, okay, then uh, they're not. No, uh, you have to be committed. For example, if we look at the burnt offering on the altar, the burnt offering had to be consumed completely. Not half, and then we, we quench the fire and we throw the remains away. No, it had to be consumed completely. And that, that is a type of something, of course, of this commitment. If we see... Um, the Israelites, when uh, with, they were uh, instructed by God to walk around Jericho, they had to walk around Jericho six days in a row, every day one time, and on the seventh day um, six times, seven times, sorry. Um, 
if they would have walked six times around Jericho on the seventh day, the walls would not have fallen. Why? Because they would not have been committed to the word of God, to God's instruction. And everything they would have done in these past, in this whole week, it would have been in vain. Commitment is essential. We see it also in the example of Joash, King Joash, when Elisha tells him to smite the arrows. And he smites uh, not all of them, eh? only uh, three, and then he stops. And uh, so he's not committed. And as a result, he missed the blessing to fully defeat Syria. So these things show that we must be committed. We must go all the way. We must be extreme Christians, as I pointed out in a message recently. Commitment is vital. So in summary, as I said in the beginning, walking with the Lord refers to our course of life. It covers every aspect of our life. And if we are truly spirit-filled and being transformed, much will fall into place automatically. But some areas we might need to give more attention, because they might be hard to overcome. A good uh, psalm that summarizes um, all of this um, <clears throat> is a Psalm 15. And there it says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And there comes the answer. He that walketh uprightly, here comes the walking, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness. Here we have the attributes of righteousness. And speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not, not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Here we have the integrity and the humility. In whose eyes a vile person is con uh, contemned, uh, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt, and change it not. Here is the commitment. He that putteth not out his money to uh, usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. A great description here of walking with the Lord. If we walk in such a way, it pleases God. It pleases God. And we, he will make us enjoy his presence. And in due time, he will deliver us and take us up like he did Enoch. And that time is at hand. Amen. Mm -hmm.